Okay, so yesterday we were talking about angular or um, yeah, angular kinetic energy or rotational kinetic energy. Today we're going to talk about angular momentum. Angular momentum carries over in terms of its concept very easily to electron shells and electrons and how they're arranged inside an atom. This type of angular momentum is for mechanical systems. For electrons, it's a quantum mechanical issue. So quantum mechanics has to do with the discrete integer change of things. So just like we did standing waves, you know, where we had nodes, uh, there were only certain nodes which were, or um, configurations which would appear, and they were always integers, like one, two, three, four. In the same way, the same thing happens in quantum mechanics with electrons. So you can think of angular momentum in two ways. One is the angular momentum due to spinning, right? So it's spinning on its own axis, and you know that the spin, right, is either up or down, because we now know, according to the right hand rule, depends which way the thing is spinning. Right? Is it spinning clockwise or counterclockwise? So that's one type. And the other type is what we'll call orbital angular momentum. So orbital angular momentum would be something like the moon going around the Earth. So the moon will have an angular momentum going around the Earth, but it also has a spin angular momentum. In fact, it just so happens the moon spins on its axis exactly once every time it goes around the Earth, which is why we only ever get to see one side of the moon. So the dark side of the moon we never see because the rotation of the moon is such that it's exactly that one face that's always facing us. Maybe I told you this, I'll just digress a little bit, but the reason for this is that there was, um, and people had suspected it since Apollo 11, was that the moon's um, gravitational uh, field is not uniform. Depends where you are. So the side that is facing us is much made of much more dense material than the side that is away from us. So over many millions or billions of years, what has happened is that it's come in synchronization, right? Because it's more, the side that faces us is more heavily or more strongly attracted to the side, that, to the Earth than the side that's away from us. Do you follow what I'm saying, or was that, yeah? Okay. We can think of, as, again, a similar thing with electrons. So we can have the electrons themselves, we could imagine the concept of them spinning on their own axis, or we could think of them as orbiting the nucleus and having an angular momentum due to that orbiting. Does that make sense? Yeah? So actually that makes up two of your quantum numbers for electrons. If you can take that concept and say, okay, I understand there's two types of angular momentum. There's only going to be discrete numbers available. It's not going to be a continuum. That is, it's not going to have continuous values like it would if we were talking about mechanics. It's going to have discrete values and only those discrete values. So as two of our quantum numbers we can think of just from this one concept of angular momentum. One is around the spin around the axis, the other one is the orbit around the nucleus. Right? Okay. So in analogy with linear momentum, where we give the letter P for the linear momentum is the mass times the velocity, we have a similar thing for angular momentum, which we give the letter L, capital L. 
It's the moment of inertia, which is the equivalent of mass in rotational systems. Mass, moment of inertia. And we have the angular velocity times compared to the linear velocity. So again, you can see this nice symmetry coming up again in terms of how we look at things. We can then write net torque as being the rate of change of angular momentum, just as net force is the rate of change of linear momentum. So net torque is the change in angular momentum over the change in time. Net force is the change in linear momentum over the change in time. And what happens, let's look back at this and try to recall something that we've already done. If I multiply both sides by delta t, what, do, what does the equation say now? Multiply both sides by delta t, what, do I, what is the equation I'm left with? Yeah? Perfect. Yes. Impulse, that is, the net force times delta T, is equal to the change in momentum. Exactly. Right? So you remember what impulse is. So now you can remember that, yes, the rate of change of momentum is, in fact, the net force that's applied. Similarly, we get this. The rate of change of angular momentum gives us the net torque. Or if we talk about applying a torque for a given period of time, we will have a change in the angular momentum, providing it's a force that's ex uh, a torque which is external to the system. If there is no change, that is, there's no external force applied, then the angular momentum must be conserved. That is, it does not change. This explains why an ice skater who starts a turn with his or her arms out like this, brings it in, changing their moment of inertia, why they have to start spinning faster conservation of angular momentum makes them spin faster. They've changed their moment of inertia. It's only an internal force, that is the system changed from the inside. And so now in order for angular momentum to be conserved, naturally they start spinning faster because they've reduced their moment of inertia. Reduce their moment of inertia, moment of inertia times um, Angular velocity is our angular momentum. So if this one goes down, gets smaller, this one must go up. And similarly, to slow down at the end of that spin that they've done, they put their arms out. They've now increased the moment of inertia. Since it's an internal force, the angular velocity must have also decreased decreased to, keep, again, keep it constant. So it's a new concept, but at the same time, it's very much related to what we've already learned. It's just the same, pretty much in ways of thinking, as linear momentum. Yes? It depends on how the collision occurred. There could be some spinning occurring, <coughs> right? There could be, but it would depend exactly on how the force or how the collision occurred as to whether or not there would be any change, okay? Um, 
one of the demonstrations I could give you is if I was standing or sitting on one of those turntables and I had the wheel going like this and I turned it exactly the other way, I would have changed the angular momentum by a factor of two. And what would have to happen is I would then have to spin the other way in order to conserve it. So angular momentum collisions are a little more tricky. All right? Again, this is about as far as we can go just using algebra. For those of you taking AP next year, you're almost certainly taking AP Calc. So by the end of the year, you'll actually be able to do most of this work in calculus. And for those of you, of you who want, what we'll do is allow you to take AP Physics C mechanics exam rather than AP Physics 1. And that will actually excuse you from three credits of physics going to college. If you take AP Physics C and you get a four or a five on the AP exam, you will in fact, almost every school will excuse you from the first year physics requirement of uh, any science degree, engineering or physics. You probably don't need it if you're going to do a biology based major. Uh, algebra based physics is enough for that. But for any other type of major, you really need to have uh, calculus-based physics. And this is what I was just saying. If the net torque on an object is zero, the total angular momentum is constant. Just like if the net, torque, the net force on a system is zero, the linear momentum is maintained. Here's the um, ice stancer I was just talking about, right? Large moment of inertia, small angular velocity. Small moment of inertia, large angular velocity. And divers do the same thing. The reason they tuck the reason they tuck is so that they spin faster. They can get around quicker in the time frame they've got to, before they hit the water. The same thing happens in some ski and uh, snowboard tricks, right? If you look at ski and snowboard tricks, they're typically trying to reduce their moment of inertia so that they spin faster. So just like the other angular vectors, the angular momentum vector also points along the axis of rotation. In this case, the, L of the angular momentum of the person is up, angular momentum of the, the platform is down. It gets a little trickier when you start talking about gyroscopes because now what you're talking about is having a torque, right, which is trying to push it over. The torque being the force of gravity, right, on the uh, spinning disc, whereas the angular momentum wants to stay up. And so what you end up with is this precession that goes around. We're not gonna do that mathematics, it's too difficult for this class. But that's something that you would do in college, in first year. Um, mechanics. Okay, so let's have a look at an example. A mass M attached to the end of a string revolves in a circle on a frictionless tabletop. The other end of the string passes through a hole in the table. The reason we put it here is so that we can remove the influence of gravity. You'll remember when we were doing circular, uniform circular motion that the, um, the string was going you know, is, is angled down because gravity was acting. In this case, we're putting it on a uh, frictionless tabletop so that uh, we can eliminate gravity from the consideration. Initially, the mass revolves with a speed V1 of 2.4 meters per second. So that would be the tangential velocity. 
in a circle of radius 0.8 metres. The string is then slowly pulled through the hole so that the radius is reduced to R2 equals 0.48 metres. So now, the same thing with no friction on it, it's pulled, the radius is made shorter. What did you find happened when you did that with that um, rubber stopper that you were rotating around, the whirly gig thing with the string? Were you using that? Did you see me using it? No? Okay, I'll do a little demonstration for you a little later on that. But what you'll see is that as you pull the string in, it gets faster and faster and faster. Just like Mercury moves very fast around the sun, and the Earth moves less fast around the sun. What is the speed V2 of the mass now? Well, the force exerted by the string on the mass M does not alter its angular momentum about the axis of rotation because the force is exerted towards the axis, right, along that, along that radial line towards the axis. That is, the force of tension in the string is not at right angles. So there is no net torque being applied. No net torque being applied means that we don't have any change in the net angular momentum of the system. The conservation of angular momentum tells us that the moment of inertia in the first instance times the angular velocity must equal the moment of inertia in the second instance times its angular velocity. The mass is a particle with a moment of inertia I equals mr squared. Right, so it's almost like we're treating it like a point mass. If we substitute, we find that we've got mr1 squared times the angular velocity in the first instance equals mr2 squared times the angular velocity in the second instance. We can now divide across and we end up with the masses cancelling out. The second angular velocity now equals the first angular velocity times the ratio of the, of the um, squares of those two radii. And since the radial, the um, tangential velocity is equal to r times the angular velocity, we can now come up with v2 is equal to r2 times omega2, which is equal to r2 times omega1 times the ratio of those two squares. which is the same as R2, V1 over R1, R1 over R2 squared. Equals V1, R1 over R2. See, we lose an R1 and an R2. So we now just multiply it through the initial velocity, the first radius divided by the second radius, we see that it's increased to four meters per second. We're now gonna move on to a summary of rotational motion. Cole, could I ask you not to be talking while I'm trying to record this? Thank you, it's very distracting. Okay. So now we're going to move on to a summary of rotational motion. Angles are measured in radians. A whole circle is 2 pi radians. Angular velocity is the rate of change of angular position. Angular acceleration is the rate of change of angular velocity. The angular velocity and acceleration can be directly related to the linear velocity and acceleration at any point on 
the object that's spinning. It just depends how far away from the axis of rotation that point is. Frequency is the number of revolutions per second. Period is the inverse of the frequency and is the amount of time it takes to complete one revolution. So, frequency is the number of revolutions per second. Period is the amount of time in seconds it takes to complete one revolution. So if you like, it's seconds per revolution. The equations for rotational motion with constant angular acceleration have the same form as those for linear motion with constant acceleration. Remember when we were studying kinematics. In order for us to use those algebra-based kinematics equations, we had to have a constant acceleration. If we didn't, we had to break the problem up into two parts or three parts, depending on how many times the acceleration changed, and assume that we had some sort of discontinuity where it went dramatically, like in an infinitesimal amount of time, went from one to the other. That, of course, is not physically realistic, but it helps us keep the problem simple. If we use calculus, we can actually take into account that slow, real change from one acceleration to another. Torque is the vector cross product of force and lever arm. Rotational inertia depends not only on the mass of an object, but also on the way its mass is distributed around the axis of rotation. So it doesn't matter just matter how much mass the thing has, it all depends, also depends on which way you're rotating it. You may not be rotating it if it's a cylinder around the center of the cylinder. You may be rotating it like a coin on a table, right? It's spinning on a table. That is, it's spinning on its edge. So you've also got to know the axis of rotation. Angular acceleration is proportional to the torque and inversely proportional to the rotational inertia. This is Newton's second law for rotation. That's how he would have written it. Remember that initially, Newton's second law was acceleration equals the force divided by the mass, right? We're saying the same thing here, the torque sorry, angular acceleration, alpha, is equal to the net torque divided by the angular acceleration. An object that is rotating has rotational kinetic energy. If it's translating as well, the translational kinetic energy must be added to the rotational to find the total kinetic energy. Angular momentum, L, is equal to the moment of inertia times the angular velocity. If the net torque on an object is zero, its angular momentum does not change. In other words, angular momentum is conserved in that case. And that's the end of this unit on rotational motion. Any questions?